Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the host of Netflix's Chelsea, Chelsea Handler and Mashable's Saba Hamdi. Where do you want me? Here? Hi, everybody. Hi. Hey, everyone. Social good. <laughs> Thanks for being socially good with us. Oh, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. Um, so to start off, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your kind of your career trajectory um, and how you decide to shake things up with your Netflix show. Chelsea is the first talk show to premiere around the globe um, in over 190 countries in 22 different languages, which is pretty awesome. I mean, everyone here should appreciate it. I don't know. I was waiting for a round of applause. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Yeah, no, you have to let people applaud when they feel like it, I think. <laughs> um, Go! And it's the first talk show for the internet, like for internet TV, basically. Yes. Um, but, so why was it important for you to move away from the more celebrity gossip and humor that you had with your e-show with this new Netflix show? Well, because it was boring. You know, I mean, I think when you... <laughs> When you have to talk about the same kind of stuff all day long and the same celebrities making asses out of themselves over and over right. again, you know, like anything, it gets boring. It's like eating the same meal every day. So um, when I, it was a lot of fun for a while, and it was a great learning experience about how to run a show and how to kind of, and it was fun for comics too, for me to bring right. like a bunch of comedians on and give them kind of a platform. Um, but like anything, you kind of want to evolve and grow up a little bit more. And for me, it was really important to just, if I'm going to be in the medium, uh, you know, in this medium, then I wanted to do something a little bit more thoughtful and it, that had some sort of impact and footprint in a good way. Um, and so I thought, let me do a show that can encompass more than that, you know, where I can bring scientists on, I can bring um, politicians on, and we can actually learn about things that I'm interested and curious about and do that on a bigger on a bigger scale. And ha having it be in 190 countries is a huge bonus because right. you have to be responsible in that way. And you have to acknowledge you know, the governments in other countries and the poverty in other countries. And hopefully be able to be informative while being entertaining. And that's been my goal with this show. And it's hard to kind of do a show where you know, nobody's done kind of like said, forget the format. Let me just, one night there's gonna be a dinner party where I talk about religion with Reese Witherspoon and Common and Nagin Farsad, and then the next night's gonna be me going to Russia for an entire episode. Right. It, it wasn't done that way, but I wanted, I was said, why not? Why do we have to have a format? Why mm -hmm. can't it just be a talk show where you turn it on and you don't know what you're gonna get? Sometimes there's in-studio guests, and sometimes it is about Russia and why you don't need to go there. <laughs> so. <laughs> I feel like I'm doing the Lord's work, okay? <laughs> um, and how did you and Netflix decide um the, on the global strategy, like the distribution? Well, I didn't really decide anything for Netflix. They <laughs> mentioned that they were in 190 countries, and I was like, oh, whoopsie. I didn't even think about that. You know, I was like, great. And I didn't even think about the actual uh, ripple effect of mm -hmm. that, you know, being recognized in different countries when you're going there. And so obviously there are many countries that aren't going, the humor isn't going to translate. <laughs> Um, so I don't have to worry about not being able to vacation there in a bikini or anything. <laughs> but um, they, it's really cool because they input it into, you know, it takes like 36 hours for the show to turn around because they input it and then it immediately spits out into 190 different countries, but it has to be translated into 22 different yeah. languages also. So they have all these linguists that had to watch, like study me and my vernacular and like my kind of the way that I speak and, you know, I use words that mean other things and they have to translate that so that it lands. So that can't be a fun job for anybody, <laughs> um, especially with humor, you know, that's so hard to translate. But um, I just, you know, with English speaking countries, I'm sure that it resonates more than with non English speaking countries. But part of the great opportunity with Netflix is that I've gotten to go around the world right. while filming myself. You know, I got, we got to go to Tokyo and Mexico and kind of highlight the cultural differences and sameness in all of those places because a lot of people aren't ever going to get to go to those places. Right. So why not film me doing it? Because, you know, I'm not shy and I don't care <laughs> if I look like an asshole. So let's capitalize on that. And so for next season, I think we're going to probably go even further. You know, I think... Um, or farther, I should say. Like we're gonna, I think we're gonna go to India and we're That's gonna cool. go to Scandinavia and really like get in there because those episodes have been really well received and mm -hmm. people like to see that kind of stuff. And I love it. I love to go to places where I don't feel comfortable. What's kind of been your biggest takeaway when you go to these places? Like has there been a moment where you're like, wow, this is 
unreal because it's so different than. Well, I mean, I think the, the biggest takeaway is always how similar we all are, that we're all human beings. Right. Like, everybody's got a family that they love. You know, something that I always hear, people always go, what's, so when we talk about certain cultures or certain religions, people always tend to say, oh, that, uh, you know, they're very family oriented. It's like, everyone's family oriented. <laughs> no one hates families. There's not like a religion or, I mean, unless you're ISIS, like everybody's into their family. It's not that unique. So when you travel the world and you're able to showcase that, right. there's more sameness than there is difference, always. You know, Tokyo for me, it was so impressive. There's a 99% literacy rate. Kids are walking to school when they're five years old. There's a high suicide rate because they're expected to do a lot. Yeah. But conversely, there are so many things about that society that you think, wow, they've really, they're so much more advanced than us in terms of humanity, in terms of taking care of each other. So, um, you know, things like that. If I can do a show where I can do that in a comedic way, then, you know, all my dreams have come true. How do you decide? And remain single, all my <laughs> dreams have come true. <laughs> Everyone likes being single. Um, it's a moment to be single. <laughs> it's a good time to be single. How do you decide um, like what you want to tackle when you're going when you're prepping to go to these countries? Like, do you guys just go with the flow once you get there? Yeah, we like, we, <laughs> we go and we're like, this is different. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, we try. We have a lot of producers who work on it, and I like to try. Now that we've done it once for the first season, and yeah. we kind of got a, a vibe. I want to just dig into their, you know, you want to dig into their politics. You want to dig right. into their family life. You want to, like, when we went to Tokyo, we, I went to geisha training school. So you do something that's, like, you know, completely out there and right. then also delve into their culture in a real way mm -hmm. because obviously that's archaic or becoming archaic. Um, but just all the things that, you know, you would see if you travel there, I think. So you do the, like, the big, you know, the big commercial things and touristy things, but also balance it with stuff that's a little bit more introspective and that you can kind of read the culture a little bit more. Um, and I like to travel anyway, so if I can do it while I'm working, you know, I'm getting killing two birds with one stone. Right. And back to the homeland of LA <laughs> where you film, um, like you mentioned, you have like the wide variety of guests, like your first episode focused on education and it was like, Pitbull. <laughs> we had the Secretary of Education, John King, who's coming back to give me another test to see if I've Amazing. learned anything. And, uh, and then we had Drew Barrymore and then Pitbull, but it was all education related. Yeah, exactly. Because Drew, Drew <laughs> Pitbull has a bunch of charter schools, <laughs> but, um, and Drew never went to college. I never went to mm -hmm. college, you know, and there's that stigma attached. If you don't go to college, for me, I overcompensated so much by reading everything, right. trying so hard to make sure that I'm not as, you know, don't sound like I didn't go to college. Yeah. So it was kind of that theme of the show. And the theme of the show, all in all, is th that educational format. Like, I'm pretending that Netflix is sending me to college, and I'm making the most of it, because they're paying. <laughs> I would love to go to Netflix's college. Yeah, there, it is. It's like Netflix University. <laughs> we kind of all already go to Netflix. College. Yeah, we do in we a way, all, we, all, we all binge their shows. We know about jail, right? Because yeah. we're just a new black. Exactly, right? <laughs> um, I guess moving, I'm, well, you kind of touched on this, or what's next and where else you want to go, but with the show, what else, what el other things do you kind of want to do? Do you want to focus on other issues that you haven't yet been able to delve into? or? Yeah, I mean, the election has been a big part of it because obviously, you know, people, you don't, you, you're going to alienate, people always say, well, you're going to alienate a certain audience if you're too pro-Hillary, if you're too, I'm like, I, that's all right. I don't want those people watching me. <laughs> I'm not trying to make friends with them. So, and I think it's so important that I won't shut up about it. I will not. I don't care how annoying or loud I am. It's important to be loud. That's not an option for this country. Then we're going backwards. Then we're, everything that we've worked for for years and years and years is, is going to be taken away from us yeah. in every sense of the word. And I mean literally and figuratively. So I think if you have a soapbox, stand on it and scream. <laughs> This can also be your soapbox if you want to stand and scream right now. No, I think I'm talking loudly enough. <laughs> I don't want to scare anybody. Well, speaking of the election, you also do a lot with Rock the Vote. Yeah, we want... teamed up with Rock the Vote. We had a really, we're having a really successful partnership getting unregistered voters to vote and people who think they can vote for Gary Johnson not to vote for Gary Johnson. <laughs> 
Um, how did that kind of come together? Like, what made you want to partner up this time around? Well, I've been really vocal, obviously, about my feelings yeah. about the election. And I, I find people who don't have opinions about things like that annoying. You know, when people <laughs> or celebrities are like, I don't want to talk politics. It's like, don't be a baby, okay? Don't be a coward. This is important. Right. You know, if five people don't buy a ticket to your movie, then it, really? <laughs> so I think it's really... It, important to do that and to be a, a spokesperson for that. And I was very vociferous about Hillary and the DNC and the campaign. So they came, Rock the Vote came to me and said, do you want to partner up and have some of the people? And we've registered thousands of unregistered voters. Awesome. So we're going to keep doing that. Um, you know, they asked me to be, thank you. I mean, I want to. I want to go to Ohio. I want to go to Pennsylvania. I mean, with my schedule and everything, I'm not at liberty to do all these things, but I'm like, let's send people there. Let's yeah. get all these kids registered. We can't, you know, have this kind of, like, lead in the polls and not do something about it. Um, but also, you know, they, we were talking about, I was, they were asking me to be a surrogate for the campaign, mm -hmm. for Hillary's campaign. I'm like, that's too much. I don't need to be a surrogate <laughs> because I can do that without, so I don't want to be responsible in the way I, you know, talk about drug use or sex or, <laughs> or curse. I'm like, I don't want anyone telling me, hey, tone it down. So I'll help you. I don't have to be a surrogate. <laughs> um, uh, so, but yeah, I mean, I've been vocal about it because obviously I think you need to be. And also, aside from the show, you have another social good initiative. Um, you're going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro as yeah. part of the climb for Karam team? Right? Karam, yes. It's a uh, refugee, it's a Syrian refugee organization um, that I work with uh, to keep kids going to school, to keep them getting educated while they're living in the refugee camps and keep them with their families. Yeah. So my brother and I are going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro to raise money and awareness to these kids in January. Oh, wow. And he's a big climber. I've never climbed, so. Oh, boy. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. <laughs> but I'm committed to it. I'm going to do it. And if I can do it with anyone, I can do it with my brother. He's kind of like the husband I'll never have. So <laughs> He's the closest man to me. What about Chunk? <laughs> Chunk, is, <laughs> Chunk is just a dog. Even though I don't know if he could tough Count Mount Kilimanjaro, if he could tough that out. But um, yeah, my brother said, well, there be, he goes, you know, there's not going to be alcohol for 10 days. I'm like, yes, I'm aware of that. I didn't think that that was something I could ask for. That's not how badly off I am. Well, how did you hear about the foundation and how do you guys decide that this is something you wanted to do? Leon Weaseltier, shoot, I don't want to say his name <laughs> wrong. He's, he, I did a, a piece with him in the New York Times Magazine, mm -hmm. um, Leon Weaseltier, he said, if I'm saying this wrong, I'm going to hate myself after this. Uh, can somebody fact check that? <laughs> uh, I'm not kidding. Um, he put me in touch with a woman named Lena. And because uh, I said I really want to help, I want to maybe talk about getting some of these kids over here and right. fostering them or figuring out a way uh, to help them. And she said it's really complicated to adopt. And by the way, you're not a good candidate for that. <laughs> but <laughs> I was like, okay, thank God, I tried. Um, you just had to, you had to say <laughs> it. I didn't want to do it anyway. Um, but you can support them financially, obviously. And, you know, that's what I am doing. Is I'm doing that's all I can do at this point. But then, you know, this climb will help bring awareness and attention to all those kids that are displaced. And obviously that's horrifying on such a global scale and yeah. such a global level. So, you know, if you can put your money where your mouth is, it's really important to do that. And that's, if that's all you can do especially, just do it. Um, and know that it's going to a good place. So I've been working with her for, through Ramadan to keep them being able to celebrate Ramadan in their refugee camps and with their families. And, um, and then they send me pictures, so Aww. it's cute. Yeah, Sweet. yeah. And you, you can send them pictures from the climb. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can. Thank you. <laughs> At the last leg. I'll be on the top of the yeah. mountain trying to, <laughs> trying to Snapchat. I'm like, where am I? <laughs> Why don't I have any Wi-Fi? <laughs> Um, and I guess lastly, I wanted to, I mean, this is the Social Good Summit, and um, our theme is obviously connecting today and creating tomorrow. So I wanted to ask you what type of world you wanted to live in by 2030 and where you see yourself in shaping that world. Well, I think there are so many important conversations to have, like with climate change. We're doing an episode of, on my show that's dedicated solely to the climate change with um, the Secretary of Energy, Ernest Moniz, is coming on to talk about it in a way that everybody can digest. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, my show, what I really set out to do and what I am doing and I feel really prideful about is, is to make everything digestible to people who don't necessarily understand right. it. You know, a lot of us are adults. I'm 41 years old and it took like three explain, explanations of a superdelegate for me to get 
get it, mm -hmm. to swallow it. I'm like, I, I, what? I mean, every time I'm like, I just don't understand. Why are they here? So I know that if I'm, if I feel that way, that there are hundreds of thousands of other people right. that have those same questions. And so to, bring, to have a format where I can explain that, you know, and it's not condescending, it's honest. It's mm -hmm. better to, to ask the question than to pretend you know something you don't. Right. Or not understand something, you know, and especially in this political climate, and with politics in general, it's hard to understand. You know, it's hard to understand the mechanics of everything and how things work. So um, when uh, w the contribution I want to make is through my show and, and talking about issues that people are scared to tackle or that they might be too serious for a talk show. I don't care if it's too serious and I, people don't want to watch one night. You don't have to watch my show every night. You know, I want to make people more educated and not only educate them, but let people, inform people how to get involved in something that they really care about. A lot of people don't know how to vote because they just think it's too complicated. Yeah. And it's like, if you give them a website, go to this website and fill out all this and you're registered, then, then that's taking a step out of there. You know, I know that if I had to do some things on my own, I would never get there. You know, luckily I have assistants who help me do a lot of stuff. <laughs> Because honestly, I would just be too lazy. Right. So that's my goal. And the goal is with the climate, you know, this is an integral time in shaping the rest of our lives. And things have to change, and you have to participate now. And it's about educating people how they can, what they can do on the smallest scale to make a difference. Um, and you know, obviously poverty and, and, and the, what's happening in the Middle East, it's really, really scary. Yeah. So anything you, know, you can do, bless you, to help <laughs> is, is important. Is there any advice you have for people to get on their own soapboxes? Kind of like, do you have any tips for them if they are afraid to kind of find their voice? Well, I think, yeah, I think you definitely you shouldn't be, I mean, you've got to tap into your inner voice because what's the point of being here, you know? You've got to, it, it doesn't, it's not about being, like, I don't think life or entertainment or any of this garbage is about winning a popularity contest. It's about like, you know deep down what the right thing to do is, right. and you should do it, and make sure that you believe in what you're doing, you feel strong about your opinion, and you're, you're informed about your opinion, and you're willing to learn, and you're willing to have your opinion changed by the right people. You know, you shouldn't be so intransigent that you can't take advice or le learn and pivot and go, okay, but you know, it's a waste of time to just be a passerby. That's no good for anybody. You're not making an impression and you're not leaving an impression. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I think we're good. Thanks, Chelsea. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Happy Sunday. <laughs>